all over the place. So all you needed to do then was to, and it's a classic example. It, you see this over and over again. You have this, uh, um, I remember the exact, term. so there's a, there's a, um, an existential condition in which something has to be done in order for the organism to survive that whatever that it's being confronted with. And then that existential phenomenon then becomes genetically hard, um, hardwired in a sense. And that's, that's like the lipids and the hysteresis versus the DNA. Okay. The DNA is af and the RNA and the protein, that dogma, yes, and, yes. and um, Watson calls it just that. Um, I'm sorry, Crick. In Crick's book, he, he said it's dogma. It's just it's just a, uh, a shorthand for we don't really understand what's going on here, but we're going to give it a label. We're going to say it's DNA protein, uh, RNA protein, but that's descriptive. It's not mechanistic. It's not really understanding the the causal relationship. Anyway, I'm rambling on. Sorry. Wonderful. Thank you. I, one of the great things about this group is that I I'm increasingly I don't need to do anything because things seem to just start. Um, I wonder if it, it actually would be useful, John, to dig into this business of reasoning after the fact, uh, of um, uh, this sort of critique of what, what you see as um, a, a fundamentally synchronic way of explaining things which doesn't take account of the diachronic processes. Um, I mean, can, can, you, can you sort of explain, give some examples as to where, um, I don't know, p p sort of the work of people like Lee Smolin go wrong? Well, again, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a Kipling just so story. It's, it's, it's trying to reason from the, the present appearance backwards, mm -hmm. which we know is illogical. Oh, dear. It's ex post facto thinking. And it's fine. Um, so basically, I've concluded that I mean, Solanaeus is thought to be the founder of biology. You didn't say a lot. And, but, and Linnaeus basically just allowed us to label organisms with binomial nomenclature. We're still there. We haven't moved from that, from that position because we continue to merely I'm apply talking. terminology without actually understanding the uh, underlying <coughs> causation. So there are many papers, for example, um, in the literature where they talk about some evolutionary transition at the molecular level. Uh, classic example is Joe Thornton's paper on the evolution of the glucocorticoid receptor from the mineralocorticoid receptor. It's a brilliant paper and has all the right pieces in it, but they, but it's like re rearranging the deck chairs. He doesn't, ex he's not, and he will not violate the first, I think the first tenet of Darwinism is that, um, that, that is random, uh, I'm sorry, Peter, you're right. It's not Darwin who said it's random mutation. He just, Darwin said it was random. These are random changes. And then natural selection makes the call as to how to, how and why to, to, to uh, exploit that, if you will. But that's all after the fact reasoning. Yeah. So, so the problem I, is that there's a logical, there's a logical uh, underpinning to all of this. And it, you know, we all love a good story, right? Um, we yeah. talked about that in the last Zoom, but the problem is if it's just leading us down the garden path, and that's another issue, you know, the, the, we, the, the Garden of Eden story, you know, er, that snake is Ouroboros, okay? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're constantly telling us ourselves these stories to make ourselves feel okay about our mortality. Yeah. In reality, that's not doing, it's not helping us, it's yeah. hindering us. So I want to ask Peter, because Peter, you've mm -hmm. got your uh, distinction that you make between um, synthetic and analytic um, thinking, where it is, is what John's talking about, about this reasoning after the fact, is that the same as your synthetic reasoning? No, I don't think so. I think synthetic means that given some starting point, you show where they go to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what well, analytic is actually finding the starting point. Okay, so if so, is finding the starting point? Um, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Um, it, is that still at risk, John, of uh, your reasoning after the fact? If people are actually thinking analytically and they're trying to think back to origins of things, but they still find themselves falling foul of this 
think thinking after the fact is is that is that how you see it i don't i don't know if that question is clear but um i've said many times i, I pride myself and pride goes before the fall everything i say is predicated on experimental evidence the problem with um a pure inductive way of thinking is that you fall into that trap or potentially you do and i think you will fall into the trap because without that objective hypothesis testing um you will in fact just go through that same do loop in a in a different way you need the experimentation to allow you to free yourself from the um subjective way that you know bohm talks about our senses having evolved which okay. makes a lot of sense to me Okay, so is this question then about reasoning after the fact, then a question about the role of experiment in our um, our yeah. thinking about our uh, thinking about nature? It's about the role of experiment, is it? Absolutely, and every every balanced equation is a con is a consequence of ex of experimentation, basically. Okay, that's the way I look at it. So what I, I'm trying to I, I, I've tried to understand how I backed into this position. I mean, I did it. Um, pragmatically, but then all of a sudden it, take, it took on, pardon the pun, a life of its own in the sense that experimentation is really the order of the day. It's, it's, and, it, and it falls into the bailiwick even of education, that, you, that, that without a mind that is always thinking beyond the apparent, you're not going to learn. You're only going to regurgitate what's you know, being told you, right? Yeah, so, okay. So it has a lot of manifestations, a lot, a lot of implications, in my opinion. So there's sure. a lot... Peter? Well, I'm not sure what John means by induction here. I mean, it means a lot of different things. Um, to well, me, it means making the big guess and the big hypothetical leap, which will explain a lot of things. Right, I'm, say, I'm saying induction in the sense that it's purely, uh, you know, it's a reasoned rather than a test, than a, than a experimentally tested kind of um, ev ev evidence for whatever you're- Well, you do the experimental testing afterwards. Sure. Once you've got the idea. Well, but, but I, I think the chain experimentation is really key. You know, you just have one experiment that leads to another, to another, to another. That's really what I'm interested in. Well, that's because not always possible to do. Sometimes you need to do a lot of reasoning first and then. Sure. Go yeah, into but, you know, like in, in, in evolution, it was, um, you know, Darwin gets this package in, in the mail and it's this uh, flower that's got a huge, you know, it's an orchid with a huge tube. And the, uh, the person who sent him the orchid says, okay, now find an organism that benefits from that. And he, and he did. It took him about three years to do it. Um, similarly, you have, you know, even um, the, the um, Higgs boson. I mean, uh, it was all speculative until you had the data. It was 48 only years. But, 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 but we kind of knew it was likely to be found. But I'm, I'm going to talk about an interesting case in physics when I, on Monday when I give my lecture to Amper. Tuesday. Tuesday, sorry. <laughs> not the first example of that was... Actually, it could be, it could be Wednesday, I'm not sure. I mean, 19, wasn't it 1920 and they, the, some, I don't know, maybe it was Einstein who goes out on a, you know, to, to the Southern Hemisphere and sees the eclipse and he can, he can document was that in light, right? So that was evidence, empiric evidence to support his idea of gravitational effects of, on photons, for example. Mm. I'm not so convinced that in the case of physics that evidence follows immediately from a theory. Theories are usually a long way from, from it and you have to manipulate them a lot to find a, a way of making them evidential. You know, um, Pons and uh, whatever his name, you know, the cold fusion, that fell apart because it couldn't, they couldn't come up with the goods. Well, nobody really believed it, really, because essentially the probability is so, so remote that this would happen. Um, it's against all previous, you know, when they came up with this, thought, oh, come on, this can't be true. And uh, we've had that before. We had that when somebody claimed the velocity of light, uh, something was traveling faster than the velocity of light. Neutrinos, was it? Uh, it was Cherenkov radiation or something like that. It wasn't Cherenkov, oh, no. It was neutrinos were traveling faster oh, than light. Yeah. Remember the Grand Sass experiment. And, you know, what I said was that, this experiment simply measures a length and a time. If they are not very closely correlated, then you, know, you can easily get them out of sync. Uh, that's what they did do. 
<laughs> and you know, there was all this stuff about velocity of light being exceeded, and it just wasn't plausible. So we didn't believe it. No matter what they'd said, we didn't believe it. And there, there are people who claim experiments, and you just say, I'm sorry, we don't believe you. Yeah. On lots of things, on biological ones more than anything. But um, one of the biggest breakthroughs in 20th century medicine was this Australian pathologist who realized that ulcer was caused by Heliobacter uh -huh. and not by stress. And the only way you could actually convince anyone of the val validity of what he was saying is he swallowed the stuff and he developed the symptoms. And then there was this huge NIH panel discussion, and now everybody agrees that, that he was right. Mm. So, you know, again, experimentation was the really, the, the ultimate. But where, did, where did the idea come from in the first place? The, the pathologist? He, he was doing a residency in pathology. I can't remember his name. Marshall, Barry Marshall. Barry Marshall. Barry Marshall, thank you. And he was looking at, you know, you have to do a certain number of slides for a certain number of diseases and, you know, come up with the right call. Anyway, so he's looking at these slides and he's seeing the bacteria in the, in the tissue, okay? And he just, all of a sudden, he realized that the, at least there was an association between the heliobacter and the, and the ulcer. And then he, he you, know, he swall, you know, he swallowed the Kool-Aid. <laughs> if you will, it wasn't Kool-Aid, it was, back, you know, a bacterial broth with, with these heliobacter in it. And he became sick. Not sick enough that he actually became, you know, uh, had the, he, he had all, all the symptoms of ulcer. Yeah. The, the only way to make the others swallow it, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Won't catch me doing it. <laughs> no. I, no, I believe. It's <laughs> not the not the only time that's happened, but right. Quite often. Uh, well, Jenner too, right? Didn't Jenner have to uh, vaccinate himself or? I think there was some proof of Yeah, no, I'm not sure about that one, but, but there, there, there was Lindemann in the First World War that when they saw planes were going down a spin and out of control, he said, I know how to solve that. And so he, he actually had to put his plane into a spin at the risk of his life to, to, to prove that he could do it. He went into a dive or something to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he had to, if, if his... If his hypothesis had been wrong, he would have been a goner. Well, that's the, uh, the, the paradox is that seeing is believing, but you cannot believe everything you see. No, right? not, so not. there's always that uh, di dichotomy. I mean, uh, there, he was lucky because there are some planes that after you know, X number of spins, sometimes it's as short as one and a half, you <laughs> cannot recover. So he was a little bit lucky too. <laughs> so how bad it is, yeah. I can believe that. Yeah. So what did you do? He invented the uh, vertical stabilizer? Or what, what came out of that? I may have no. just come up with a technique, which is to, to do the counterintuitive thing, and that's to point the nose down. Yeah. <laughs> I see. Got it. Yeah, yeah, my, it's my, not what you think to do, but that's what you have to do. Yeah. yeah. My, my brother-in-law is, is a professional pilot, as are my two nephews. But anyway, so they had these friends who were flying back from some air circus uh, they, they were flying um, these stunt planes and they were fooling around. They got too close, they touched and they both went down and died. So, I mean, you know, it's very, it's a very labile condition. So uh, just to come back to this, if, if it is about the issue of experiment and the, the primacy of experiment, and I've been reading, um, Carlo rovelli has got this tiny little book on, um, I can't remember what it's called now, Seven, Seven Principles Seven. of Physics or something like that. Yeah. It's quite nice. And at the end, he talks about the scientific impulse in um, human beings and imagines, you know, Neanderthals thinking about uh, antelope tracks and the scientific um, Neanderthal amongst them is actually analyzing the antelope tracks in the snow or in the earth and predicting how they're going to catch an antelope so that they can eat and uh, maybe not get eaten by something else. And and he says, you know, this is the scientific impulse. This, this process of using our intelligence to analyze the evidence in front of us, that there's something absolutely fundamental there. And of course, if we couldn't do that, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have been here. We wouldn't be here now. Um, but is he, is he right completely, John? Or is, is there something missing in his account? Well, I think, you know, the hand to mouth kind of thing. Yeah, he's right. But life is more than just a hand to mouth. You know, it's not just a subsistence living. 
and I would maintain that beyond the synchronic, which is what he's talking about, you have to, you're, it behooves us to go beyond the synchronic to the diachronic. Okay. Uh, what I said to you was, you know, so then, you know, the offspring, they go to Lascaux and they paint, and they, they paint these yeah, yeah, yeah. paintings of, of, of the hunt, for example. And, and that's where that diachronic uh, feature comes in because then it, 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 go, it transcends the immediate. It's not just the animal tracks. It's also where they, they live and how they live and what, they, what kinds of plants they eat. And, you know, that kind of dynamic kind of an analysis is really where our origins derive from. But I also, and I, I don't want to offend anyone, but that's actually my theory of religion too, because as I said, go out and catch food for, the, for the, my family in the, in the cave. And, you know, I confront the saber-toothed tiger. If I blink, the tiger is eating me. If I'm, you know, ahead of the curve, I kill the tiger. And then you, if you permute, if you iterate that over and over again, that belief in self is really where religion, I think, derives from. I don't think it. Yeah. I think it's coming from the, from us upward, not from uh, uh, from above. And it makes a lot of sense to me that that's that organizing principle of um, the calcium waves. It's it's a it's a it's a uh, Maslow peak moment, killing that saber toothed tiger, and it can be learned. Your physiology can learn that it becomes reflexive because the receptors in your muscle and your brain and everything in between that integrates that it can be um, programmed because it's mediated by recept receptors and we know that those receptors their density and their numbers actually facilitate that process so there's an underlying set of principles there as well what about when you solve a mathematical equation is that the same thing yeah yes it's a it's yeah yeah it's the it's the purest form of this of the same thing so are we saying that our logic and our resolution of logical problems is physiological fundamentally i think so yeah all right well i'd like to know what other people think about that i'm sorry <laughs> yeah. i'll, I'll mute myself i must admit when i was a kid i always thought this because i struggled with maths and as, until I was a teenager, I think, and then I started to feel that there was something something physiological in my approach to mathematical and logical problems. But that that was me. Well, I uh, Go ahead. Deep up the difficulty last night, and when I finally got it figured out, there was a ha, -ha and a little bit of a yeah. high, and I didn't see any calcium anywhere. <laughs> are you sure did you look hard enough no i i looked for it of course i've been hanging around john for a couple of years now so i'm looking for calcium i haven't seen it okay you know my my perspective on this uh hope it's close enough but um biologically uh, i get uh, that we are our, our nervous system is a really cool neural net that's recursive and can uh, cycle back upon itself. I think the big switch from uh, um, non-humans to humans is that the, the main game becomes recursive stories or narratives and, and, as opposed to just uh, physiological experiences. And as, uh, as I think about the world I live in and why people do the things they do, I, I essentially see it as a set of uh, interacting stories. And the stories are all internal, they're not external once we create that first story, whether it's the antelope or whatever, then we we feed other stories into it. So we become a storified animal. And and these all these discussions with all of you guys, they're just wonderful stories interacting with stories. There's no calcium involved <laughs> directly. Uh, and that that's not to discount the role of calcium, but at different scales, the mechanism of the thing below becomes more or less irrelevant. I, I think that we have to always be clear about the transformation at the phase or the scale shift. And for me, sociology is all, and psychology is all about stories. Okay, so I think the point about scale, I know John wants to come in, but I think the point about scale is probably really important. Um, but John. Oh, just quickly to Mark's comment. So there was a classic experiment done at UCLA where they put people into an MRI and they could tell whether they were Republican or Democrat 
and that's a story. <laughs> and that is calcium waves, I would maintain. You know, you're looking at the brain. Uh, and I understand it's, they were doing functional, um, uh, they were doing functional fMRI, which is based on, you know, you eat uh, this form of glucose that makes your brain, brain light up, but the lighting up is calcium. So so, what do we do to get rid of Trump? Let me share this. Uh, 20 years ago, <laughs> there's nothing there. 20 years ago, you 20 look years ago and there's nothing there. 20 years ago, I got interested in neural nets and went and got some stupid program with a CD in the back where you could use a, you had to use a Windows pro computer and so I had to get one. And you could um, uh, just use a 10 node neural net and it blew my mind when I saw a stupid 10 node neural net could recognize could teach itself to recognize the letter A. And so back to you, John, there's no calcium involved, but it's doing a similar thing. So I'm not discounting Ooh. calcium, but I'm also not discounting uh, neural nets and digital computers. The mechanism behind it is disassociated uh, in the phase shifts of the scales. Okay, so the brain is a computer? The brain is a computer? The brain is a neural, is a biological neural net that does computing. Okay, I want to ask Peter about that then because um, I, I know he's got a view on this. No, the brain isn't a, isn't a computer as we understand it because computer is a, is a finite machine that doesn't interact with its environment, unlike the brain. Well, yeah, yeah, the brain is the best computer and the others are de de deficient, but I, I don't need to argue the point. I think the distinction is real. I mean, the brain isn't well, the computer. Often, um, Penrose had this theory of uh, how the brain works um, based upon these uh, 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 on uh, microtubules in the neurons uh, acting as a as a network. But the fallacy there is that every neuron in your body has <laughs> microtubules. I maintain that the brain is just a concentrated site for neurons that are uh, uh, per pervasive, and that yes. and that you know, for example, Chambers or um, I'm sorry, uh, Chambers' idea of the heart problem, you know, why we see red when we're in pain, that reverts back to, you know, seeing a bloody mess when you cut yourself back, and, you know, when you're cutting up that saber-toothed tiger. That's the history, historic arc, in my opinion. So I'm saying that I don't, the brain is highly, a highly overrated organ in the sense that we know that it evolved from the skin, the organism has skin, and the skin brain idea really goes all the way back to the cell membrane of unicellular organisms. Okay. So as I say perennially, if you have a par paramecium and you put glucose in the water, the paramecium literally lights up. Calcium in that par paramecium lights up and it gravitates and locomotes to the glucose source. You put uh, glucose on my tongue and an MRI and the same thing happens. It's the same process. Me that we, that John, uh, and you can push back pretty hard on this if you like, but it seems to me that we're in a game of having the essential necessary parts of a system somehow uh, fighting against each other in some sort of human little brother brother battle. And if the parts are necessary and sufficient, you can't throw one out and one isn't more important than the other, uh, other than as we tend to identify with them. So I, I've never spent a lot of time uh, trying to prioritize whatever it would mean for something to be more important than another part. Of a, of, a, of a simple system where if you remove one, the thing dies. So you remove the DNA, it dies. I'm, I'm on your side emotionally. I mean, I think the membrane is by far more interesting. If I could only know about one, I'd wanna know about membranes. I mean, that's a personal bias, but to think a cell survives without both and that they didn't have to co-evolve, I don't understand where the emotion comes from. No, but where I'm, I'm coming from is the way that I got back from the lung, in my case, because I'm a lung biologist, to the unicellular state in gas exchange, because then you are able to then reverse the whole process and see it from the, in a prograde fashion, logically. There is a logic. It was the title of the book, Evolution, the Logic of Biology. But in, in, the, in the context of what you're saying, Mark, you can, in fact, see that hierarchy from an evolutionary standpoint. You can peel the layers back and see why A will cause B, cause C, cause D. And I would submit, and in fact, there's a genetic basis for that. The uh, target of rapamycin gene is servoed, is, is actually literally connected to the cytoskeleton. And the target of rapamycin gene controls every aspect of, the, of, of, the, of cellular metabolism, 
it is a so there's a there's a central genetic and interestingly if you uh, so the target of rapamycin gene was found because they fed mice rapamycin which is a toxin and this gene lights up but my point being that if you treat the mouse a mouse with rapamycin it extends their lifespan so it, you know it addresses that fundamental relationship between that gene and its and all of its functions so yeah andrew i was uh Sorry, firstly, there are parts of the brain that surely are neural networks. If you say, say take the visual cortex, start, starting on the retina, it, recognizing simple shapes, that is, I would say, from what I've read about it, indisputably a kind of neural network, whatever the rest of the brain is doing. So there is a very machinic part. You know, we go from the machine body into the brain. It goes machine quite, quite a long way in. I was interested in your statement, the brain is overrated. Well, in terms of its with what? quality. Yeah, I mean, I understand that, that it's, you know, I mean, if you cut it off, your head off, then you're, in pro you know, that's the end yeah. game. But my point is that, that we look at it from, from an anthropocentric perspective. There are organisms that don't have a central nervous system. All they have is a peripheral nervous system, and they're, they're okay for their environment and for their arc of evolution. Mm -hmm. My point being that I think that we tend to look at at life from our own perspective and we miss the point in my opinion the, the great in the in the great scheme of things we don't we're, we're missing the point of the cause the causal relationships and their origins okay peter can you say something because one of the presentations that you gave a while ago about uh, to the british computer society about nature's information or nature's code i can't remember what it was called yeah. but you made a very profound distinction between natural systems and our computing systems yeah well they're they're confined systems aren't they computing <clears throat> systems they have rules like this that start out with and they carry on i mean the same rules the same alphabet all that that's what a computer does but the brain doesn't do that. It has to adapt and change all the time. But isn't that what Ross Ashby, I mean, he's sort of my hero until you guys find me a replacement. I mean, to realize that a mechanistic thing, a couple of four bomb sites could, could uh, interact with an environment and change its own internal. I mean, I completely, to the extent I understand your point, Peter, I agree with you. The beautiful thing about, I would say the computer that the brain is is that it's Ashbean and it, 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 it modifies itself from experience randomly, it's testing, but when it finds something that works better, it, ad it adopts it. But it doesn't make it not a computer for me, it makes it a special class of computer. Well, if you like, but I'm talking about the computers that we've so far designed. We are designing yeah. computers that are more able to adapt to, to things now. But yeah. yeah, no, the distinction is important because the AI people drive me a little crazy in their extrapolations. <laughs> well, I'm not that one. Yeah, know. has anybody uh, been following the uh, GPT-3 stuff? No. Do you know no, about this? Well, what is it? Um, so GPT-3 is the latest sort of iteration of AI. And um, basically, it can... Um, well, there, uh, there are a number of, peop number of professionals who are quite worried because you can... Uh, ask it to do things in almost natural language and it will then write computer code automatically to to perform those functions mm. and, for that. and yeah i mean it's 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 in, it's interesting but mm. it's also you know there's something very the fact that we get excited about this stuff the fact that we try so hard to make these things happen is in itself interesting and it feels slightly pathological oh it is i'm looking convinced. for a god still looking for a god in 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 peter's uh, computer <laughs> no the brain is like a muscle if you don't use it you lose it and if we become you know uh dependent upon ai we will become their bitches pardon my language Wow. So, so there was this, you know, I, I'm sorry, I watch way too much TV. I watch Jeopardy. It's the national Alzheimer's test. And you had Big Blue, the IBM AI machine competing against the best of the best two humans. And it beat the two humans. But there were two questions that it flubbed on, which were they could not, the machine could not understand uh, because they were inferential. And it, I would maintain a, a, that a computer may be able to get a joke 
but it cannot make up a joke because it doesn't have that capacity. I'm, what I'm saying is that the AI is a closed system. It's only as good as the software that was designed by some human being or yeah. another computer. Whereas our brains, you know, I don't think a computer could have been able to come up with the idea that energy and mass could be, have an equivalency. It doesn't make any sense. It's only when you do that big arc kind of, you know, out of the box thinking like Einstein did that you come up with this stuff. That's what, mm. that's where the difference lies in my opinion. Mm. They can't always beat humans at chess because uh, Roger Penrose has come up with a problem that a chess, no chess computer can solve, but a human can solve it in a couple of minutes. Mm. You know, some weird structure on the board that they're not familiar with and that there's no obvious way of dealing with it in the way that a computer would. Right. Well, I sent you that passage from that Calvino book, uh, um, Imaginary Cities. He's talking about uh, Genghis Khan playing uh, chess against Marco Polo, and he goes through this whole um, process of reducing the chessboard down to the, you know, the little wooden piece, you know, the ebony and the um, whatever, the black and white mm -hmm. squares, you know, and that's where, you know, it, it, everything evaporates at that point because, you know, it's, it can't transcend that. He can't transcend that, that idea. But, but I, th I would submit that experimentation allows for us to do that. Yes. Okay. So we're back to experimentation. I was going to say um, the worry that we would be um, uh, Im effectively imprisoned by machines was voiced by Norbert Wiener in the 1950s. I mean, he saw, he wrote this book called The Human Use of Human Beings in, what, 1951? And, and all, of the, all of the stuff that we're seeing around us, he predicted, he, he was there. Um, but experimentation is, such a, is, is an intrinsically human activity, isn't it? Yeah. Problem solving is the, is the foil to fight or flight. You have a biological. I, I wouldn't say human. I think earthworms. Yeah, okay. I was going to correct myself, actually. Yeah. But do they problem solve? Well, I mean, they can, sure. Yeah, they do, yeah. otherwise they'd be dead. <laughs> yeah. Sure, okay. Oh, I'll just mention, so Ian Forrester wrote a wonderful short story called The Machine Stops, which is basically the same idea. And he published that in like 1905. <laughs> so, which, uh, which story, John? Oh, I can send you the link, it's called The no, Machine no, Stops. Give me the name again. The Machine Stops. By Ian, Ian Forster. Oh, okay. It was, um, it's about everybody having to live in a machine. Right, and then the machine stops and everybody's screwed because they don't know how to deal with it. You know, they become so dependent upon the machine that they, they die. <laughs> COVID-19 is that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're living there now. When the electricity grid goes out, we're all stuck. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Or well, Zoom goes down. So Mark, you're a physician. I, I, do, you, do you have any sense of how our microbiome is coping with COVID? I've asked that question on a list survey I've played with. You're, you're muted. Can't hear you. I've, I've, I've dramatically changed my interest uh, away from medicine and, and even biology to, to neighborhoods, because I think the future of the planet depends on the viability of neighborhoods, and I, and I also think that <clears throat> the test of viability is disconnectability. And so if you don't have the ability to, if you can't test, like making good software, if you don't have a way to test as you move along, and the test is what happens if the roads or the internet or the supply chains are, are shut down, and you've got to always be saying, can this neighborhood survive? And that should be the design wow. principle going forward, because as far as I can see, I'll tell you the most pissed off I can remember being in the last 10 years was reading Randers, the sole production of the, the, the latest version of the, of the uh, <clears throat> you know, the model the, that Meadows and those guys created back in the 70s. And then it, I just put it down. I couldn't even look at the book anymore because his personal conclusion is the right strategy for the world going forward is mega cities. And I'm going, <laughs> I'm going. You're you're, you're insane. <laughs> you, know, you don't you don't need a model to know that's insane. <laughs> well, we can look at the newspapers. The lack of protective equipment because uh, hospitals don't wish to afford to have backup storage. 
because they're anticipating just in time delivery. Mm -hmm. And so you have uh, lots and lots of small areas that are incapable of holding out for themselves. Yeah, my good friend uh, um, uh, Don Berwick got infatuated in 1988 with Toyota production system. <laughs> and, and then the entire medical industry shift its mindset from effectiveness, which is what we used to be about, even though we didn't name it, to efficiency. And efficiency and effectiveness are orthogonal, if not oppositional. And in healthcare, I can assure you they're oppositional. So we have efficient systems that are so fragile that you're getting to see it play out today. Efficiency should only come after you've assured effectiveness, not before. Right. I have a friend who's an ER doctor, and numerous times she would tell me that the whole point of having a 24-hour service had nothing to do with people who were in an auto accident, but was a, a backup protection in case of a major disaster. Oh, I don't think it's that well thought out, but I think that is one function. Well, that was her explanation. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's not the way it actually evolved, but it, it really was to keep normal doctors from having to get up in the middle of the night. I mean, they use nurses first, and then they use family practitioners. And finally, I'm an ER doc, boarded in internal medicine and ER medicine. So, I mean, the evolution of it is not quite what she put together, but that is a legitimate function. Yeah. I've been in one person for my entire career, and um, the criterion for being board eligible other than the usual is to do uh, original ex uh, experimental work, which was where I came in. And, um, and I've long held that that was important because the kinds of things that happen to a preterm newborn are not physiologically as apparent as they are in someone who is full, you know, fully developed. And so you have to have that, you know, that insight at a cellular and then a molecular. Mm -hmm. But my point being that I had this discussion with my, uh, an attending <laughs> um, not that long ago, and I'm, and I'm talking about this, and she says to me, Dr. Torday, do you realize that when our fellows get into trouble in the, ER, in the, in the NICU, they take out their PDAs? Well, that's ridiculous, in my opinion, because we know that every second counts. You, every second that you don't react to the situation in a preterm newborn, that sends them on a trajectory for, for the rest of their lives, okay? That is horrendous, but that's an example of how AI is co-opting our, you know, what we really know is true. Uh, you know, it's making an end run on our, on our, yeah. uh, on um, common sense. John, let me ask you a question about that, and because I've never had anyone to talk about this, I, I fortunately wasn't diagnosed as dyslexic, but clearly have moderate dyslexia, and it means that I can't personally memorize anything. And you can imagine being a, a medical student who can't memorize anything is kind of an interesting challenge. And what that means for me uh, is that I build models because I can remember models. Relationships are like Velcro, they hold it together. So your point about memorizing things, my, my, the way my life evolved, I don't think I get any credit for this, was that I would build models. And so the models were really robust. And so I could go to the emergency department and switch models and grab a model that worked. The details, I often had to look up. But the thing that would put me in the right phase space to solve the problem were these models I had. So I didn't uh, use PDAs, but when I got into treating a particular kind of uh, poisoning that I hadn't seen in a few years, then, you know, but I had the whole model to how do you think about poisoning? And then I would go look at the details. So that's how I, because you can't know everything. You can't keep everything in your head. You have to decide. And I was terrified by one of my partners who looked, had that, he had actually notes in his pocket. <laughs> he had a book of notes and he would always be looking them up. And I'm going, shit. What if he loses that book? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry for that. That's a that's a distraction. You can forget the whole thing. But Mark, your your answer to John's original question, where which was uh, what's happening in the microbiome, and you said you were less interested in the physiology and more interested in neighborhoods. Aren't they connected? And isn't it in the connection between these things that is perhaps the area which we're exploring in these discussions? You know, on the, if we're looking at the connection between quantum mechanics and biology, we're looking at the connection between the microbiome and the organization of our societies, our education system, and, and that kind of thing. Isn't it well, in those every, vertical connections? Well, look, everything is connected. 
so then the question is in your lifetime and for the things you care about, what, what is relevant, you know, and for me, the biggest danger we have is that people have lost the ability to self organize at the scale at which they live. And so that's all I care about. I mean, I'm not, I'm too old. I'm 70 years old. If I, you know, I, I love here and I go read stuff, listening to you guys is so fascinating. But when I go back to work, you know, my own work, it is how can neighborhoods build models that allow self-organizing? But might those models be enhanced if we understood, for example, uh, something of the epigenetics that is operating within those neighborhoods if and the survive, impact of the environment? Enough, yeah. Of course, if we survive long enough, that kind of enhancement can occur. I'm trying to build a basic model that uh, any mother, because I have no faith in men, sorry, <laughs> this group, <laughs> but any mother could, uh, could use to self-organize to solve problems in the neighborhood. And epigenetics, while always playing, I mean, the, the, the story that blew me away with epigenetics, John, you'll, you'll be able to clarify this, but the women who were, their grandmothers were pregnant at a certain part of gestation during the Dresden bombing, Three or four generations later, they had epigenetic traits, tra things that have been transmitted epigenetics. So epigenetics is a huge thing. It's not the lever. It's the explanation. <laughs> I'm looking for levers. Okay. John, what do you, what do you think about this? I mean, is this multi-level thinking, really, I, I suppose I'm driving at? Is that, is that really where you're, you're at? Or are you doing something else? What Mark was talking to was this interesting NPR discussion about why it is that when you have these medical breakthroughs, people don't, they run the other way. And the, these two sociologists are talking about that and they're saying that we're, we evolved from cave, cave dwellers. And that if it's not something that the group sitting around the fireplace that, that night after dinner agrees to, they don't do it. So mm -hmm. there's this, I think that's what you're talking about, Mark, isn't it? It's, it's, it's definitely a part of it. I mean, Eleanor Ostrom is closer to me than the cave dwellers, but I often go back to the same metaphor, you know, of the cave, because I think we, we make sense of uh, everything around us, as you guys have been saying, but mostly we make sense of facial expressions, bodily expressions, the ambience of a group. Yeah. And we, and I think that's what Bohm, I did Bohmian dialogue with a group for two years, you know, once every two weeks, it's the most amazing experience of my life intellectually. The group is always so much smarter than I was. And believe me, I was far more educated than anyone else in the group. It didn't matter. You know, so your point is really right. And I, but what I see is neighborhoods have lost, they don't sit around campfires anymore. They ah. look at, you know, there are no campfires. And so my friends in Sweden, they have a campfire, they have a place called Kulturum, and they get together and they made medicine the most effective and efficient system in the world in just a few years by having it a place with campfires. So that's what I'm trying to do, but I don't care about medicine. I care about health and health is in neighborhoods, not in medicine. <laughs> mm. So can you, you know, there's this hu great hue and cry now, we all know in this country, uh, because uh, people running in the opposite direction from the sci from science, you know, and it's, it's, it's evident, you know, when people not wearing masks and saying they're not going to get vaccinated, on and on and on. I did a back of the napkin calculation. We've spent about a trillion dollars on biomedical research in this country alone in the last 50 years. And it's all gone by the wayside in favor of political science. Can you explain that in a neighborhood sense? Well, you know, you and I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm happy to say anything in any group, but um, I, I just don't. Well, this may is <laughs> I find that a lot of the things Talib says make sense. Okay, I'm not a follower of anybody, but I do think that um, being able to focus, you know, where the big risks are, is really critical. And so I try not to. And, and of course, as an ER doc, that was the gig, right? Was not to miss small signals that had big negative outcomes. I mean, to me, that is the job of an ER doc is to when people come in front of you not to miss the weak signals. Well, I think that's the challenge we have in society today. Right now we have, it's clear to many of us uh, across the world that the system, even if they're not system thinkers, they know at some gut level the system was fragile and it's breaking. So my question is how do we fix it? And I'm quite, I'm, what do you call it? Uh, persevere, uh, you know, I'm, I'm iterating, you know, endlessly, maybe crazily. 
perseverating uh, on neighborhoods because families are too small, municipalities are too large, they're both necessary. But the game that we have to get good at is campfires. Okay. But can't that be deceptive? Of in the course. same way that an individual can deceive themselves. Everything you know, you can... Has that, everything has that risk. So that's why you have to do a lot of experiments. You have to have it going on a lot of places and you have to have a way for people to learn from each other without being overwhelmed by the other. In other words, you can't have an authoritarian central control because you, you just, you know, one, it's too slow and two, you, 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 you extend the mistakes, right? Um, but look, I, I, I don't know any more than you guys how to save the world, <laughs> but I do think that the domain, is, as much as I'm interested in cell membranes, the domain is in uh, neighborhoods. neighborhoods. Do you, have you heard of the Dunbar number? Yes. So something about 130 people, is that what you're thinking uh -huh. of? Well, I, I, I've gotten really turned on to scale effects. Basically, you know, intuitively, I, I thought it was important. You know, Ostrom 20 years ago says the eighth rule is nested recursions, and she doesn't really explain it very well. But when I ran into Stafford Beer, which is I think what Mark and I have in common, you know, he kept saying strange things like metacognition and metasystems. And, and I go, what the fuck? I mean, because he doesn't explain it. So I kept looking out, exploring, and I've come to the conclusion that the concept of meta is missing in America. <laughs> and it's the most important. Missing concept. everywhere. Yeah, it's the most important concept, the most important missing concept uh, for understanding complex. Uh, for me, meta and, 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 and Ashby's law are all you need to derive good sociology. <laughs> so why haven't we done it? One, I, look, I'm 70 years old and I never heard of it till I was 66. And I'm a pretty curious wide red guy. So there's something pathologic going on in America when guys like Acoff chose to have a, some mild friendly animosity with beer. To me, that's pathologic beyond belief. I, I, I hold Acoff responsible. I hold American philosophers responsible for not taking what the Europeans and particularly the British understood and they didn't bring it to America. And if, if Acoff were here, I would express my displeasure. Because okay. he knew it, he knew it. The, those guys were all in Chicago. They had to go back to Europe to keep it alive. Yeah, could you repeat what you just said? This is Russell Acoff, yes? Yes. Would you repeat what you just said about him? Well, I say this, and I look, uh, John Are Prudenod. You can take it outside. <laughs> John Prudenod's a good friend of mine, and I, I read Acoff, and I love him, but what I think happened was so American. They chose their, their business model for, for continuing their work, for getting paid. They chose their business model to be a consulting model in America. Okay? So they worked within those constraints. They only did things that had short time periods and... And they did an experiment with a community which was much more, you know, English. But but in their most of their work, it was it was working um, for short time periods uh, and not not with complex ideas. And Acoff is a complex thinker. I mean, a Acoff is brilliant, uh, truly brilliant. But he chose what he would share and emphasize in America. And he knew beer. He knew beer's work, and he chose to keep it quiet. To me, that's unforgivable. I think it was an economic decision. I'm speculating. I just look at how he made his money, the, the, the thing he set up you know, in Pennsylvania. It, it, it was just a, a way to get funding hmm. that was basically based on businesses. Okay. I, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, how we started this discussion talking about experiment and we've ended up talking about quite abstract things. John? But to the this discussion, it reminds me of a, when I was a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin, I actually came into the field of biomedical research when you didn't have to show statistical differences in your control and experimental groups. And when I got to, uh, to Wisconsin, one of the forebear, uh, uh, forerunners in that whole mission of applying statistics to, bio, to biomedical research was one of my mentors. And he could tell that I was I was digging in my heels because I wasn't tra trained that way, Sister John. Understand this. 
The reason for the statistics is important is because if you make an observation in your laboratory, the only way you can express it to somebody in another laboratory, not next door, but way far away, action mm -hmm. at a distance, non-local, is through the statistical method. And I know, we all know Rich is a statistician. You can lie with statistics, but at that time, they didn't do that yet. My point being that that was the way that people understood the, the duplicatability and reproducibility of any given observation, which is the, are the cornerstones of the scientific method. Yeah. So, yeah. Who were you talking with? Uh, Box or someone else? What? Are you talking about uh, Box? Who? George Box? Famous no, statistician who was at Wisconsin. Yeah, no, it, no he, he was, what was his name? Uh, I can think of it in a minute. He was a working biologist who contracted some chronic illness. And so he was bedridden and he was, had this long dialogue with a statistician. And so they came up with these ways of getting biologists trained in statistical methods. Okay. Um, uh, I'm blanking on his name. Richard, Richard I, I want to know why you asked me to repeat what I'd said a, a few minutes earlier. And I'd also like you to comment on lying with statistics because when we use the bell-shaped curve as the basis for most of our statistics, I think they're all lies. <laughs> well, there are. Go ahead, Rich. You can answer. Um, well, I was at Penn and I overlapped Acoff, and I didn't really know him, but I think I'd met him once or twice. And most of the people in the statistics department were poking fun at him. Um, I couldn't quite decide how that all fit. Um, the How to Lie with Statistics book is um, I think quite old. You know, I've seen it. But I was just I, making the, the, that's overt lying where you intend to yeah, lie. The, the, I, the I, reissue was 1993 and I found the original date. Yeah. I, my sense is it goes back to the 50s. Um, yeah. 54, 1954. So, um, oh. statistics is a tool, and it can be used for good or for evil, and it can be misused, and it can be done so intentionally. Oh, the, the, the biologist I was talking about is Lester Cassida. Um, he was an important reproductive biologist. I don't remember who, who he, he and someone else wrote a textbook on statistics and application to biology. But, but there's a guy um, who's now at Stanford. He used to be uh, at Yale. Um, he, he wrote a paper in 2005, the title of which was, Why is it that all biomedical research is false? That was a pretty inflammatory statement. But one of the things he points out, to your point, Mark, Worse than just fitting, you know, not not determining whether some phenomenon you're looking at is parametric or non-parametric and forcing a Gaussian curve is that by and large, people when they do biomedical research these days, they do the they do the the, the experiment experimental evidence, you know, they generate the data and then they figure out what statistics to apply. That's totally mm -hmm. wrong. Post hoc, you mean. What? Post hoc. Yeah. Post hoc. That's data mining. Not kosher. Rich? No, I agree. It's wicked. No, oh, it's bullshit. Yeah. You're just fitting the, the data to what, what you, you expect. Yeah. No, so no, I'm going to have to argue with you there. Um, exploratory data analysis is one of the absolutely fundamental and important things that you absolutely must do. Well, you can do and a pilot. That from a level of understanding from which you can now construct a confirmatory experiment. Yes, you have to construct so have an experiment. An experiment. An exploratory step. I'm yep. saying the stuff you publish, it's not a pilot experiment. Right? Yes. That's what I'm talking about. They Unless you label it as such, and then you should. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but the whole idea of, you know, using a cutoff of 0.05 is predicated on being honest about how you obtain the data and how you analyze the data. The American Statistical Association is recommending against that whole concept now. What are they going to use? Right. About time. I can tell you sociologists don't do anything like that. They just crank the data till they get the answer they want and publish it yeah. and apply yeah. for another grant. You know, it's, it's gone. Right. No I'll one. Send you link in a couple of minutes. <laughs> has, anyone here, has anyone here ever read um, 
Chris Argyris's book, The Inner Contradictions of Rigorous Research. No. Nope. If somebody smarter than me, and that would be everyone else in this group, should take a look at it. it, it, it um, I've, tr I've read it twice, but you know, it, one, Chris is a horrible writer, and, but he's also incredibly smart and has great data. So uh, what he essentially does in that book is blow away the entire construct of, of, of research the way we do it. And of course, you probably, you may know that he's sort of the father of uh, participatory action research in America. I mean, I think the Scandinavians did a better job and, and the Brits too, but, but at any rate, it, it, somebody who's really a researcher, I'd love to hear a critique of that. Uh, it's not a very big book, but it's uh, pretty arcane. But I think it essentially shakes the roots of the whole academic uh, research uh, enterprise. Thanks for that, Mark. That's interesting. It's the title of the book. The Inner Contradictions of Rigorous Research. Okay. Okay. The other thing that, in listening about statistics, and you know, I, I, I'm aware of some of the weaknesses, not all of them, but I got very interested for years in uh, uh, statistical process control. And it's interesting, you know, Mark, you may know this, beer was doing this with a Pegasus machine in, in this British steel industry in like 1953 or something, you know, long before Ford Motor Company learned about it in America. But I, I, for all of its weaknesses, and I have statisticians friends who basically start cursing when I talk about statistical process control. But the thing I like about it is that it does allow uh, the separation of uh, noise from weak signals. And to me, that's the big risk is missing weak signals. That's the whole name of the game in biomedical research is uh, separating the signal from the noise. Yeah. But in the process, you know, as you were, I, I, I would guess that Argyris is arguing that it's too reductionist. and. So in the process of trying to find the uh, truth with a lowercase t, we don't find the truth with a capital T, right? That's that's the issue. He may, yeah, it's been 10 years, but he may even go into the sociology of it, meaning what are the biases, what are the pressures put on research so that it, you know, anyway, I'll wait for somebody else to critique it rather than trying to remember it. But, but Richard, anything to say about signal noise, because that seems to be what statistics is about anyway, and process, uh, statistical process control as a layman's term for, for uh, finding weak signals? When I think of the word process control, I'm thinking of the manufacturing setup, and that's what the process is. And um, you measure the variability of the outcome at regular intervals, and if it ever gets too big, you've got to go tighten up some parameter. Does that answer the question you had in mind? Well, yeah, I was looking for an opinion. I thought it might touch a nerve and we might, you know, get some fireworks here. But no, I, you, you and I are talking about the same thing. You don't seem to have a strong opinion about its uh, place in society. Well, there was that classic experiment that they did at Harvard. I don't know. I don't know how long. It's been a long time, maybe 50 years ago, where they were testing the type 2 error. You know, you expect to see a difference and you find it. And I think it was they, they had these students who were going into a you know, an insane asylum, and they lined up normal people who, and they found that they had pathology because that was what they expected. So yeah, the type two error is, is yeah, that haunts us for sure. Um, that's a big problem. It's called, um, I have it here. It's called uh, On Being Sane in Insane Places by Di David Rosenham, <laughs> 117, where people volunteered to go into an asylum and then tried to get out and found they couldn't. There were 10 yeah, of that's them. The, that's the <laughs> it's in- um, That sounds, that sounds like any American America. corporation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amongst like many a other interesting, it's a very good book, this one. Radical constructivism. Uh, therefore, as an illustration of mental illness as being completely constructed by, as, as being a social construction. 
Yeah, Very well, good. mind to address that, you know, John North. <laughs> um, yeah. it's, it's normative. It's, it's all defined by society. That's Jeez. why the, around the campfire, you need people to occasionally be uh, eaten by cyber-toothed tigers to keep it uh, uh, grounded right. in reality. You did say cyber tooth, not saber tooth, yes? Cyber tooth, I guess. <laughs> good. Very good. Um, I always look over at Peter's face just to see what what the <laughs> extreme uh, scientist is thinking about all the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Peter, what do you make of statistics? I, I mean, physics is full of statistics now, yeah, isn't well, it? I mean, it's particle physics is full of statistics because they, the, their experiments are totally based on statistics. And, uh, well, I don't really know what to say. I mean, obviously, it is a very powerful tool. And um, there are some statistics baffle me, you know, how they come about. And um, some probability questions, for example, I can't get my head around still. I know that they're true, but I still can't get my head around. Mm. You know, the one with the three choices in the, but you've got three choices. Monty Hall the Monty Hall problem, it's called. Mm. I know what the, the true answer is, and I know why it's the true answer. I still can't get my head around it. You know, you've got three choices, and you, you've got three doors, and if you open one door, oh, yes. you get a car. If you or the other two doors, you get a goat. Yeah. So you open one door, and you get a, a goat. Mm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, you make a choice. I'm going to go for door A, say. And they say, are you sure? And you say, yes, I think I'll stick with that. I said, okay, what we'll do is open one of the other doors. So they open door B and they see a goat there. And the, the thing is, you've got to decide whether you want to change your mind or not. Do you change your mind from A to C or do you stick with A? Sounds well, like Bayesian. Apparently you've got more chance, much more chance if you, if you change your mind than if you stick with the original choice. But I've never got my head around that. Um, Even though I can see the mathematics and how it works out, it still doesn't strike to me as though it makes sense. I think it's because you have a, um, an active adversary. I see. A door B and C. Yeah. Your adversary will choose the one which is not the winner. Yeah, and that's so correct. That's what biasing it. Yes, that's a little bit of bias. I agree there. There's a bit of bias in there. Intentional bias. Yes. And it's, it's taking advantage of the intentional bias. That's <laughs> why switching is the right answer. Yeah, they can't possibly open the door. That does have the car behind because that's right. that wouldn't be the part of the problem. Yeah, I think that's the best answer I've heard, certainly. That sounds good. Can I, can I ask, is it the case when our whole uh, scientific um, research enterprise does seem to be driven by statistics and computers and all the rest of it. Is it the case that fundamentally that really means that uncertainty is the principal currency of science now? And is there a contradiction in the fact that our institutional structures of science, our publishers, our universities, those structures are, are fundamentally uncomfortable with uncertainty? Is, is there um, if you're going to do it right, you would publish negative results. The people only pus pu publish positive results. So most of the papers you see are going to be uh, showing significance at 0.05. Whereas if you publish negative results, only one out of 20 papers should show significance at 0.05. Yes. Okay. So how many publish? How many papers with negative results actually get published? Not very many. That's the problem, isn't it? Yes. Especially when meta-analysis is the coin of the realm. Sorry you know, again? When meta-analysis is really thought to be the coin of the realm, that you take the analysis of all the analyses and you say, oh, well, this proves it. But the problem is it's the underpinning of that is these are all the, the findings that were positive. They don't, it doesn't factor in the negative findings. They're never published. And, and one of the reasons that that's really heinous is because my understanding is when they did this soul searching at Harvard Medical School about people cheating, there was this cardiologist who was publishing 400 papers a year and finally got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. 
they can, the, the Blue Ribbon Panel, among other things, concluded that one of the reasons for this is because people no longer are doing master's theses in this country, where people would try to reproduce data. That was a sort of a choke point. It was a, it was a you know, a check against that kind of thing. But I actually just published a paper recently with a German botanist, the question on why control an experiment. I was trying to point out to my colleagues that it was important to realize that, you know, the Bohm idea, we're still, we're just messing around. We're just, we're accepting the fact that everything's shifting all the time. We use the controls in order to sort of poise at the system long enough to be able to observe and to con make con conclusions. But the reality is it's, con everything is, you know, in flux. We need to, we need to acknowledge that. It's an artificial, we're artificially analyzing nature. Yeah. I mean, John, when you talk about controlling an experiment, you're, you're generally, you're, you're conceiving of um, uh, controlled trials and that kind of thing, are you? So if there's a control group, Man, or are you, you know, talking about I something? Was PhD, I was, I was, I was at my wit's end because I had made a, I had made an experimental observation. I could not reproduce it. And we used radioactive tracers at that time. And I had this vial of radioactivity. And just to make sure that I hadn't gone nuts, I would stick it in the, the gamma counter and I would get the same result all the time. So at least I knew something was constant, you know, plus or minus. But, yeah. but I think, you know, we, we do, the fact that we acknowledge that there's a possibility 20, you know, 5% uh, of the time that you came up with this answer fallaciously, but you can still get it published, tells us that we're really just, you know, it's a, con it's a confeder confederacy of um, dunces, if you will. You know, we have to recognize that it's not, these are not absolute on, uh, observations until you can replicate them and other people see the same thing. That's critically important. If we make, mention an anecdotal case, a friend of mine ha has a daughter who got banned for drink driving, banned for two years and served a sentence. This was about two years ago she finished. And I said, oh, she's got a license back. And they said, no. I said, why not? You know, she's done a sentence. And they, they, they suddenly came up with this thing that said, people of your age, and she was probably about 35 or something, or 30s, said, there's a study done in some peculiar university somewhere in the States, which said that people are likely to offend of that age group. Yeah. Now, this is incredible that they've, in, that, that they've hauled this up yes, from right. nowhere. A one study somewhere, and one set of results. It was unbelievable. And it took a hell of a lot of hassle months before she got a license back. So this isn't science, this is politics. No, this, this, is, this is people using um, um, literature in, in uh, nefarious ways to achieve political ends. But you would never take one study as being meaning anything, especially in that kind of field. But you, when the you have as, many, as a, many, many studies if, if independently done with before it would mean anything. I would but say that's completely out of order because the whole legal structure that came up with the two year suspended license issue should have dealt with all that stuff right up front. And well, so no, the, 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 the agreement is, is once you've done your sentence, you get your license back. Yes, and the, 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 this issue should have been dealt with as part of the law design of the law, not not as a after the fact attempted interpretation. Yeah, it's a bit. It was. Uh, it was. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that that kind of thing could happen, that they could misuse scientific research in that way. But this is the whole thing about the whole system, isn't it? So what is the system that allows that paper to get published in the first place? And it's about money. It's about publishers making money. What is the system that causes the academic to write the bloody thing in the first place? Well, that's well, to do with well. the that's the, yeah, but no, that's to do with the institutional conditions of their university and the fact that they want to hold on to their job and they've got to publish stupid papers to do it. You know, they, it's it's so multi-level this, and and you know, if you keep on following that train of logic down, you get back to the microbiome, don't you? <laughs> or, or or the neighborhood. One thing Talib said, I was reading him a couple of days ago. Uh, was that uh, um, I grew up in southern Louisiana, and, and I, so this was really poignant. He says corruption is much easier to detect in neighborhoods than at larger scales, and I think 
it isn't that people are more or less corrupt, it's that it's hard to find at larger scales. And finding corruption, which is what you're describing, is, is critical. Hmm. Interesting. The flip side of this is this thing called uh, risk homeostasis in sociologic literature. Um, the prime example that I came across uh, was, so there's this pedestrian, uh, uh, you know, there's a traffic light, people crossing the street, and a lot of people are being killed by motorists. So the authorities decide to paint a crosswalk. Guess what happened? More people got killed because people assume that they're protected by this thing, right? So there's, it, that's kind of, yeah, it, it's, I think it's the flip side of what we're talking about. Faith in, in some methodology that's going to protect you. And it goes back to what Mark, I think your comments, Mark, about the neighborhood and common sense. And what is it that we all agree is of value? And yeah, I think it's cool that cyber tooth tiger eats somebody every once in a while just to keep people you know in line i think ostrom gave us really important information because she was an empiricist she you know we we tried to hire her we did hire her before she died to help us design stuff and she said look we i've never i'm not an interventionist i just go out and study how it is that people have cooperated in keeping the commons of different ilk uh going for in some cases 700 years but I, I think those patterns, uh, they always came back to smaller is better. And it's because she discovered those seven, then she added an eighth rule that are always present when people successfully manage the commons. And those are affordable, cheap, face-to-face -face interactions. And her, her funny expression, her, 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 her Nobel Prize uh, winning speech is definitely worth watching. The one she did at Indiana, the reread is, is easier to listen to. But, um, you know, she uh, she uses this expression "cheap talk," and she's you know she's a Midwesterner, so and I am too, so I can appreciate the Midwest humor in that. But you know, cheap talk is the whole deal. Yeah, but these are all conversations, aren't they? A, a yes. And and they organize themselves at different levels. The utterances are situated obviously within individuals with their own biology, their own history, their own environment. And their own place, yes, which yes, is environment. That, that's the critical thing. So my my thinking these days is that, you know, trying to always make Ashby part of my life, I think people living in place, the model is their experience. It's actually not abstracted. They, they have the detail. So that's why they have more uh, ability to deal with uh, certain forms of variety is because they don't have an abstract model. They have the model of having you know, walked under the street light that's out, of tripped over the walkway that's broken, of, you know, being uh, accosted by an outsider, whatever. It's a lived experience. That's why I think mothers um, are the best people to self-organize our neighborhoods. Because they pay familiar with the Tversky and Kahneman stuff? You know, there, there, there's a lot Tversky and there is really uh, psychologists. Uh, one of them is dead. Uh, uh, Tversky died. Anyway, so the, it was the basis for that movie Moneyball, the book Moneyball. So this counterintuitive way of thinking and which was gave the, the that insight provided uh, advantage. I, I've read the book, I know the theory, I don't understand it. It's almost as if they're saying there's this parallel universe that we don't really understand, but, but that we can utilize that information effectively. Um, I, I just find it remarkable. And, and you know, these guys had the inside track so anyway, I just thought I'd mention that because that's an example of how uh, it's a it's a, um, a tangible e evidence for this sort of implicate uh, order that I think that uh, that Bohm talks about. These guys have that have that had that insight. So what are and, they saying? You know, it's hard to understand. It's like this counter. It's it's basically counterintuitive, but there is a rationale to it. It's not anecdotal. It's like there is a system that they use to gain an ins advantage by seeing beyond the, you know, the apparent and understanding oh the, the, this. the reflective of the, of, the, of, the truth, of the truth that lies beyond, you know, You've got to close this. reality, basically. So, uh, I can come back. Are, are they looking, are they looking, what, what are they looking at? Are they looking at the environment? Are they looking at people? Are they looking at biography, history? Yeah, they've been they've been asked to to analyze many different situations and have come up with answers that no one else can come up with, basically. 
They've used their psychological acumen to, to solve very difficult problems. And, you know, they were used by the Israeli army uh, at one point. They were consultants mm -hmm. to the army, for example. And so yeah. they were doing it across uh, large spans, that, which is what's unique. My, and I don't know if you were responding to this, John, or if it's uh, a non sequitur, but I, I, I think that people sitting around the campfire or mothers in neighborhoods, they have so much information available to them that is being handled behind their consciousness that it, it <coughs> is a kind of awareness that allows them to negotiate better futures uh, among each other than... And these guys could do that at scale, which is why they became wealthy. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I mean, I'm of the opinion that, that there are, that these neuroendocrine hormones that um, align our physiology work better in women than in men. Um, and um, yeah, and I think there is this uh, insightful kind of way of thinking that is intuitive, but real. And I think that it, you know, if we could figure that out, <laughs> I think we probably yeah. be a better species. Yeah, right. I mean, I you know I wonder why it is that you know women were the dominant you know gender in society um, until you know I think until monotheism and that sort of knocked the wheels off you know the women being the dominant. Um, How do we know that? I think there's historic evidence for well, it. You know, people have claimed it, but I don't know that we know that. Like the Minoans, you know, you know, people in the Middle East. Um, I thought it was, you know, it was females that dominated. But then there were these problems with, you know, the reproductive cycle and that all that kind of stuff that sort of allowed men to make an end run. But my yeah. point is that I think that women produce oxytocin more oxytocin than men do for sure. Oxytocin has a huge effect, it, it, in impact, effect on this sort of holistic way of understanding. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, I, I don't know if it's, it's, you know, this is the first evidence I know of this being discussed really cleverly, and I think the play is Lysistrata, you know, where the men are off having a war and the women take over. So, I mean, there's some, this thing we are talking about here today has been in play for, you know, a few thousand years, this idea that women and men have different inclinations and different uh, approaches. Well, I think it's remarkable that we're still debating the same things that the Greeks were debating 2,500 years ago. We still okay. haven't solved it, but we recognize it. You know, it's like uh, Justice Potter when he was asked about pornography. He said, I don't know how, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. That kind of thing. Hmm. Yeah. Harry, um, you're, you're sort of lurking in the background there. I, have you got an opinion on this? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> okay, that's fair wisdom. enough. <laughs> that's the wisdom we lack. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we are we are a group of men talking about this stuff. That's all. I mean, I think, um, yeah, um, it seems to me that that we we do need some sort of vertical vertical thinking and john i think uh, this is how i understand your arguments about the diachronic that the, the diachronic reaches into history it reaches across um levels of biological org organization uh, is that right yeah yeah, yeah and, and my sense is that uh, you know it, it, the unicell is the dominant form we don't we only think that it's this com complexification of biology that's that's all the rage. It's not, and I think epigenetics demonstrates that. That's the whole. That's the whole point of an epigenetic inher inheritance mechanism, and th that in that beyond that, that the unicell is in sync with the cosmos, mm. and so I am of the opinion that that nexus between our consciousness and the consciousness of the cosmos, because they align with one another. That's where you want to be. It's 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 you know it's Spock versus Kirk, you know, in in uh, Star in Star Trek. It's that intuitive understanding of the way the cosmos works, as opposed to this behavior of you know responding to emotions that just muck everything up. So, uh, yeah. So yes. I I kind of I think of Stafford Beer too, um, and I think 
I, I, I did meet him. I, I did meet him, but I didn't know it because um, he used to come to my university to go to the music department every now and then. But um, I suspect that, well, and everybody says that he was somebody who uh, was intellectually working in very in very abstract ways with organizations and thinking about a variety and cybernetic concepts but within his own being he was also very spiritual and very you know very connected to his environment and and i think john you made the comment about beer that he was intuitive and i think that's correct i think it, it was intuitive and, and I think that raises the question as to whether it's possible to start to be explicit about this stuff without it, and without it necessarily just being down to intuition, that actually there's some science there to support it. I mean, the, I, I haven't actually read beer. I've only read what you, you know, what's in Wikipedia mm -hmm. and the stuff you've sent me. And there was that re really interesting holistic kind of diagram that you sent me. And what I said to you, I believe, if I remember correctly, was that that sort of that CPU that was in the middle of all of, uh, you know, that diagram, it yeah. didn't deep dive. That's, and maybe yes, that's, that's, no, that's absolutely the intuition. Well, it, it, it deep dives in the sense that it is recursive, so it's a fractal. Um, but I think it's correct that there is no history. And that is a problem. And, and that is a problem for the whole of um, the systems world, I think. Uh, the, the, the history hasn't been taken seriously in, in that world of thought. And I say this as someone who's been fascinated by this stuff for a very long time. And I suppose I've had a, um, something of a revelation in talking to you and in becoming aware of the importance of history. And it's ironic for Beer because he was a Marxist. Um, so he should have known this. Wow. But maybe you took it for granted, and that's why you didn't deal with it. Well, obviously, yes, I think, I think so. But I think then... Oh, excuse me. I think the, possi the possibility of actually re-looking at some of this stuff and putting the history into it, maybe that there is something to explore there. Well, I thought that that paper that I posted on the Google Doc um, about the um, wave collapse, gets at that in the sense mm. that there is a there is a continuum of quantum mechanics and the biology so the atom and the cell being homologs that offers opportunity to think in those terms because that really goes back to the almost the origins not quite mm. and again it, it starts to sound hand wavy i know especially when you when i try to make the uh, case for the singularity being the prototype for the for the use for the atom and the cell they, they both derive from the singularity, and of course, I can't demonstrate that. But I've, I, I've posited that um, you could actually use the cellular. In effect, um, uh, what's his name? The British biologist, uh, Nobel laureate. He was talking about the middle out approach. Brenner, Sid Brenner was suggesting the same thing that I do, but he was, but he was doing it like a pile of spaghetti and 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 doing an analysis. I'm saying no, no. You have to look at the end, how the ends stick out beyond the surface of the cell to see how everything is in, interconnected in a, in a, um, communal, in, a um, in that messaging way that I, that I talk about with regard to embryology. But my point yeah. being that I do think that, so my, my, my way of thinking in terms of the reverse engineering, walking the whole process back was, well, why did the cell occur, you know, occur in the first place? And I think that the prototype, the pre-adaptive the pre state of the cell was the singularity. So you can query this unicell in ways that might give you hypothesis testing ways of understanding the physics. The physics, so we have a bioassay for the physics, and then you can bounce one another, them off one another. That's been my sort of pet theory. Okay, so uh, John's, the paper that John's just mentioned is at the bottom of the Google Doc. In fact, you, you posted a couple of papers there, haven't you? We, um, the, the, yeah. So um, I, it might be worth actually looking at that stuff because I think, I think, I mean, we've wandered about a bit today, but I think there is this core idea about the role of history or the, the embeddedness and overlap between historical processes and, st and structural conditions. That's, that's, that's this phylogeny and ontogeny, basically. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, 
I threw a question in for Peter about. Yeah, I'm looking. Yeah, I don't really think the Big Bang is real science myself. And uh, I think the time is infinite before and after. And um, I think my own work on dark energy um, shows that there isn't a beginning to time and that the world shift doesn't necessarily mean expansion as we often think it does in the ordinary way. There's something different about it. So also the temperature aspect. Well, again, I don't think time and the Big Bang says you start off with a high temperature and it cools, but I'm not convinced by that. Um, I think what I was saying can, can accommodate. I don't have to have a Big Bang. It, it yeah. just helps. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about what you're saying. I'm talking about what I'm being asked on here. And also, I'm also being asked if there's any, any relevance to ordinary life, to what I do. And uh, I would say what I do is all about discovering patterns and things, and often those patterns do have relevance to ordinary life. Mm. Yeah. Is it a pattern that connects? It's a pattern that connects everything, really, in many yeah. ways. So that, that's okay. Bateson's phrase. Mm. Um, I just want to be clear. It might not have been clear from my cryptic question. There was nothing... Uh, dismissive or derogatory it was actually oh, no, I, didn't, I didn't think there was but uh, okay good good, good. But, but i was just saying i do think there is a connection with on and life in that way alone but there, there are other connections as well um yeah I, I like it when we come back to that because i think that your as i understand these conversations um your piece is the the long wavelength in these other conversations and john's is the next longest wavelength and all the rest of us have shorter wavelengths. That's a nice <laughs> way of putting it. Yeah. So there you are using a physics analogy there. Yeah, they, <laughs> but it came from your physiology first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I, th I think we should probably uh, leave it until next week. Oh, next week. Yes. Now, we're going to yeah. have to think about this. Next week, uh, we're all involved. Well, me, Peter, Andrew, uh, John, um, and anybody else who wants to come and join us is involved in a conference of the um, AMPA, the Association of the Alternative Natural Association. Natural, God, why, I, what's wrong with me? I'm tired. So Peter, you do it. <laughs> Alternative Natural Philosophy Association, which is that's a haircut. That's the problem. It's the it's forty years old last year, so it's been going a long time. Yeah. And uh, the first talk on Monday will be a kind of historical account of AMPA and such things. Um, there, there, one of the interesting things, Mark, you'll be interested in this possibly, is that um, the guy who's giving the talk uh, was very familiar with Gordon Pass, particularly and Stafford Beer. Um, and one of the key people, I didn't know this Peter, Ted Bastin in AMPA, uh, was a close friend of Gordon Pask and went with uh, Pask to, um, I, th I think it was the States, where, where Pask was doing lots of stuff with early teaching machines and um, I didn't um, know that artificial intelligence. Was yeah, he was one of the key people in AMPA. Uh, he's been, died about 10 years ago or eight years ago or so, mm -hmm. but, but uh, he was one of the key people in AMPA when I first started going to AMPA. How do we get in on this conference? Those I will send are... a link round. It's Zoom, and it's at 5 p.m. No, actually, on Monday, it's 4.30. Um, so same time as this, this talk, which is why I'm hesitating about what we do next week. But um, Well, there'll be a lot of talks about many things over yes. this next few weeks. Yes, and there, there, is a, there is a sort of a program for the first week, uh, which features Peter, Luke Kaufman, um, Andrew, I'm actually Andrew. I think I've put you in the second week now. Whatever. Um, just I need yeah, I know. I know. It's whatever. Um, uh, um, and and yeah, lots of interesting things, but some big, you know, big yeah, talks. Talk, talks about lots of things. I mean, Dino Bazzetti is talking, isn't he? He's yeah, he's he's going to do something very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, send the the uh, the timing and the the talks and how yeah. we uh, how we get in. That, that'd be yeah. great. Um, is there any way I was that happy I can... to take on new members as well? Yes. So, Peter, is there any way I can avoid stepping in it? Uh, the stuff on the sidewalk 
in mentioning the Big Bang. I mean, no, you can mention the Big Bang. You can actually give a whole talk saying the Big Bang is great. You know, many people think so. I, I'm just, I'm just dubious, but it's still up there for discussion. It's, it's not what anybody says. It's what, it, what's true. And you might be right, or I might be right, or somebody else might be right. And well, I think we, actually I just figured my exit strategy. I'm just going to show Sheldon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter really. I mean, it doesn't matter to you. You don't really need it for your work. That's it's just a, just a metaphor that you use, just like people used to use God created the universe kind of thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just well, a metaphor. That's nice symmetry between, you know, the sexual act and the, you know, the big bang, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did send you George Bataille to read, didn't I, John? I don't know if you've looked at it, but uh, he's in that ballpark. <laughs> so we've just anthropomorphized <laughs> the entire universe. Tiger in something, and he had this analogy that I, I didn't understand what he was talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Yeah, but it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. No, Ampere is very open. It's, um, and I mean, my, well, my whole experience of, um, of when I came to Liverpool and I met Peter and Peter invited me to this this conference my um, I think I realized that Peter Lou, knew Lou Kaufman who I knew from the American Society for Cybernetics and I had no idea that there was this other other world which was actually revolving much closer to physics involving the same people you didn't know there was an implicate order no I didn't know the implicate was exactly right that was it <laughs> It was the implicate order of the American Society for Cybernetics, and and damn it, it needs an implicate order. So um, <laughs> anyway, well, is, is there some desire to find a unified field theory of everything uh, by the by Ant, Antpa, or is it just whatever? It's up to the individual. It's up to whoever feels that they've got a drive to do something. Uh, you know what they do. There's there's no common program for Antpa. It's, you know, it's for, well, there used to be something, there used to be something called the, what was that called? That, that's it. The, there used to be a kind of thing uh, that Ed yeah. and Clive and other people got involved in. Can't remember what it was called. Combinatorial uh, hierarchy. Combinatorial oh, hierarchy, yes. remember, yeah. Combinatorial hierarchy. Uh, in the early days, that was a driving force of many, but that's less prominent now, though, you know, maybe one or two people are still interested in that. Right. Okay. Well, um, what I was asking was, is it is it better to be more gen generalist than trying to really find, you know, a pot of gold kind of thing? <laughs> Just better to do what you what you feel good at, and uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> but was it Lee Smolin you mentioned? Yeah. Um, said that there were hill climbers and valley crossers, mm -hmm. and the, the hill climber, you know, climbs their own mountain to and keeps working on one particular thing to try to get to perfection in it, where the valley crosser goes into various areas and mm. connects. And uh, Amper yeah. is more a valley crossers conference than a hill climbers. Mm. Well, for, you know, I've, I was a downhill sk skier for many years and the analogy I use is, you know, at first you go across the mountain and it's bumpy, but then you find the fall, the fall line, all of a sudden everything starts, you know, there's this great synthesis. That's the way I think, that there will, there is some way to find that fall line. Certainly water does it. Okay. Mm. Yes. <laughs> Very zen. Yeah, I, I thought that that's actually what Peter's null potency thing is and the, uh, uh, what's the guy's equations? Um, Nothier and... Uh, no, sir. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought all these things are about, is that... Yeah, it's all to get the big picture, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm only interested in the big picture, really. And, it, and it's all about, uh, the I don't know, uh, in chemistry, you know, it's um, the least free energy. I mean, it's the easy, doing the easiest thing is the way I say it. And I think that's the most interesting uh, thing I've come across in the last few years is that and are you guys familiar with William Schindel? Bill's an interesting guy. I could send you some stuff. He's sort of the father of something called pattern-based systems engineering. And he essentially claims repeatedly 
uh, he's a very nice guy, uh, an American from Indiana, but he's a mathematician first, and then an uh, aeronautical engineer, and then he has his own company, which helps people uh, abstract patterns out of uh, engineering models. But uh, yeah, so he, he's a very interesting guy, and he has what he calls the, the smallest possible model, which I think is relevant to some of this. And uh, yeah, I've lost my train of thought, but I'll, I'll try to introduce some of, a bit. oh, I know why, because he's the guy who kept saying, look, the, the system science is um, Hamilton's equations. I mean, and of course, I'd never heard of Hamilton until I, I'd met Bill, so I kept going, who the hell is Hamilton? And, uh, and he, you know, so for the IS and the INCOC and all of these folks, it's worth looking at. And I think if I understand what's going on here, Peter is has a, a new rendition of Hamilton's equations, and and it maybe is the origin of all systems, which is what Bill Shindell's been saying for a, a decade or more. Anyway, enough. <laughs> Certainly use other work of Hamilton's a lot, yeah. his quaternions. So as a humanist, I find it interesting that I think there's a consensus that The Great Gatsby is the perfect novel. So if, if Fitzgerald could pull that off, I think science can do the equivalent in, in science okay. as well. Got to have goals, but yeah, well, we're all looking I, I, for the Gatsby or something like that. Yeah. I think, I think um, yeah, I, well, I, I, my feeling is where we are heading towards something and there's, there's something that keeps us wanting to come back, which is interesting. And, um, and I don't think it's just habit. I think there is something here. Moth to a flame. Yeah, well, there is that as well. Yeah, <laughs> look, there's a book, look. <laughs> yes. Exactly. And relevance of the nil potent. I mean, I think that's what Bill Shindell is saying. That, that's what Peter's saying. That's why my question isn't pushing on Peter. It's drawing him out. Keep telling us how, helping us realize how relevant it is to every day, you know, to saving, you know, humanity, frankly, because it's at risk. Well, I think yeah, if you want to be morally good, you've got to get your intellectual side right as well. You know, that's often been said. But Peter, do you think, I mean, I, I, I've said this a couple of times now, I just want to know what your, you know, my insight was that I kept thinking nil potent meant zero until I realized, no, zero is not the answer. The answer is everything. All material things are, are contingent on the nil potent. Mm -hmm. That's where you have to start. And then you back into the, you know, in my opinion, it's either matter or energy. So now you can, you know, once you factor out the matter, energy is what's left. And now you're in Alfred North Whitehead territory. <laughs> I don't advocate that, but I'm just saying that, you know, it's all energy and now you have to follow the energetic patterns. But Well, I mean, physics is all about energy anyway, always was. But I think you and I agree that the cell and the atom are, are I'm sorry, zero is that the cell is the uh, a homologue of the... Yeah, um, of the, yeah. I mean, I've, I've talked about it in my own work. I've actually so, gone through a lot of homologues in earlier, you know, publications. So it's saying that this pattern repeats in lots of places. Yes. Yeah. So that, that idea of the attractor poising the system and giving it meaning. So again, you know, come back to the, or some origin um, a Cartesian coordinates and then, you know, the origin is what, you know, zero, the cell. And again, I, you know, I, I, then I lapse into the Big Bang because I feel compelled to find the yeah. home. Well, I, I, I don't like it because it's, uh, it's um, too contingent. It's not general. Yeah, you're on the corner. I understand that. I get that. I understand that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, Peter. I think that a lot of us, when we hear the word zero, and, and I first heard Mark making a joke, I think about nothing, you know, we tend to think of nothing as simplifying. And your nothing is the opposite of simplifying because it, the mark, the conversation we had last week, when you make the mark, you're equally uh, obligated would be my word, but that's a moral comment, uh, to define what it's not. <laughs> so, you, so you're suddenly always into everything. It's the least, it's the, the thing we least understand, Zero. We don't understand it at all. Do you, do you, do you distinguish zero and nothing? Um, not really, no. I think, um, I, th I think they are the same thing. But they're everything was, is the, you know, it took me a few weeks to realize 
you're not saying a reduction to, to nothing. You're saying a, an expansion to nothing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, in fact, my rewrite structure is a series of cardinalities of nothing, if you like. Yeah. Mark, maybe you, you can, you can guide me into Peter's work in a way that I won't be lost or overwhelmed. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I can send, I can, I can, uh, point people to stuff and I think um, yeah there is a point at which we actually do need to do some reading and, and I think reading of John's work reading of Peter's work all of that is is really important um, but um, it is exciting I'm, 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 I'm excited by this I think uh, Ampa next week will be very interesting Lou Kaufman is also on a very similar wavelength to Peter and they've been working together um, He's the most interesting speaker I've heard in decades. I mean, I, I met him through this, mm. and I was well, that Sunday session, and I I could listen to that guy forever. He's extraordinary. He's a, he's he's um, yeah, he's an extraordinary figure. Um, but um, yeah, so you know we've we've got some we've got some amazing brains here, really. I think, and that's that's uh, this is what universities should be doing. And that's another discussion because I've had a discussion with um, John Williamson about what's happening with his group, Q, uh, Qsicle, um, this group, and a couple of other groups where basically the professoriate are organizing themselves internationally using technology. And this is a real thing that's happening um, under the present circumstances. And, and this about is, time. And about time. And this is, this is important. And it's going to be institutionalized at some point. But we, we should be on top of it and we should be mindful about steering it in a responsible direction. This so is clearly if, happening. If Jerry Seinfeld and uh, Larry David could be paid $450 million for some, the Seinfeld series, which was about nothing, we mm. should be able to do the same. Well, I, you know, I, you, just, you just hope to do the right thing. Um, I do, uh, James Lovelock gave an interview um, this, this week because he's 101. And um, he, he's, he was asked, you know, does he have any adv advice for young scientists? And he said, treat science like art. Don't expect to make a living from it. And I thought that was a lovely, that was an important thing to say, actually, because the pathologies of our publication system, our universities, all of these things are fundamentally anti-intellectual and anti-scientific. So we need to be doing more of this, even if we don't get paid for it. Yeah, I, I uh, been asked to write a do a piece for I don't know the American Society for Cybernetics or something by Pillay, so I'm working on it. But for me, uh, I've taken Acoff and Aristotle's um, beauty aesthetics, uh, or you know, a beauty, good, truth, and economy, which I picked up from um, Giordani and, and Acoff actually, and and it's become a big part of my life. And listening to you guys, what what you just quoted. Um, Lovelock of saying is for me it's standing in aesthetics and looking at ethics and science and economy it's a very different stance and he just he just said what I've figured out in the last few years if you don't if you don't organize society and your own internal society your own way of thinking about the world from aesthetics from what's emotionally you know this gets very much to John's world that's where I, I think if we stand there, if we stand where the American culture stands, we stand on economy, we get, um, we get lawyers telling you what you, they think you can get away with. We get only technology in service to, to making stuff. And we end up with propaganda trying to convince you that something's beautiful, it's really ugly. And as soon as you figure it out, they sell you another one. So where you stand in that four part thing in Lovelock, I think just, just said quite wonderfully because of who he is that standing on aesthetics will help you create a world we want to live in yes. where science is a big part of it but so is ethics and i also think he's a perfect example of john's argument that in old age we produce more oxytocin because he's clearly a much more cuddly character than he used to be <laughs> 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 It's losing anyway, on, on that <laughs> note, I hope to see you next week. Um, so we start on Monday and we're going every day at five o'clock in the UK. Um, uh, I know it cuts into the middle of the day for people in the States, but hopefully it will work. Not and um, late morning. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, well, you, you know, it's time for your, your lunch and it's time for our dinner. So um, <laughs> thank you for letting me in this group. I, oh, it's I, great. I it's a pleasure to have you. Um, it's a pleasure to have all of you. I mean, it's amazing. I, I can't believe people keep on wanting to come back, really, but uh, it's great. Um, okay. Let's keep on going. Okay, we'll see you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.